Hey guys, I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for joining today. Today we're resuming our Ask Me Anything sessions, uh, and Future Trader 71 is here today. The uh, AMAs are designed to be quick and casual. There's no prepared presentation, and we're going to limit the session to 30 minutes. So guys, go ahead and start typing your questions right now, and I'm going to turn things over to FT in just one second. I also want to remind everybody that the uh, uh, session is recorded, and I will post the recording on BMT later today. Okay, FT, you should have control. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Very cool. All right, just... Uh... Let's start out with our first question, I guess. Let me just pull up the questions panel. Okay. Uh, first, I have to kind of read out this disclaimer. It's required. Uh, trading futures options on futures and foreign currency involves substantial risk of loss. It is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not indicative of future results. The information provided is provided for educational purposes only. Please verify the information before using it in your own trading. Okay. And we don't have video yet from you. You should see okay, a there chart. Goes. Okay, very cool. Sorry about the delay. All right, let's take a look here. Christopher asks, how do you set your targets when we are at all-time highs? Good question. Uh, since I'm relying on uh, volume, uh, profiling, like you see in this chart here, there's a there's a typical volume profile. This is a balanced market. The market has not breached to the first hour's high or low. I cannot. I don't have any information on prices that are higher because we're at like nine or ten year highs. So what I default back to is the traditional stuff. And by traditional stuff, I mean uh, things like. Uh, measured moves, uh, pattern breakouts, cup and handles, that sort of stuff, which, which um, you know, without uh, offending anyone, I feel are um, more of a second-rate um, uh, approach for me personally. I'm not saying that that's how they are for everyone, but to me, I feel like the information provided by the volume profile is much, much superior uh, to tell me how the auction is going versus information gains through like some patterns and things like that. So I, I go to these measured moves. <laughs> there, there are a couple I'm looking at. There's a small one that takes into account the balance zone that we're in, which started on the 18th. <coughs> Excuse me. The low of that uh, balance zone is 30, uh, 31, uh, 30 and a quarter. And it goes up to 54.50, projected from 34.50. We took out the measured move target yesterday, and the secondary target is 17.73.75. And then on top of that, I've overlaid uh, another measured move, which is a bigger move. And I know I've covered these in this morning's Trader Byte on YouTube, uh, the live video I do every morning. Uh, but I'll go over it here again. The second measured move is from 46.75, which is the most recent swing low, to the uh, to this high at 98.50, pulled back to 18, projected up, gives me 17.70. So the objective, uh, as I discussed in this morning's trader bite for today, was 17.70. There's some confluence between 73, 75, 70, and then in addition to that, uh, I use a statistical um, projection of where the week uh, is likely to, uh, where the week's range is likely to end up, and where the high and the low of the week based on the open is likely to end up. Yesterday's open was at 17.54. I'm projecting up uh, 20, uh, 24 points from the weekly uh, open gives me 17.78. So 17.70, 73.75, and 78 are the upside targets uh, for now. And those are just uh, kind of a gross, so to speak, like raw targets that I'm working with. OK. Robert is asking, why historical odds of something happening doesn't give you an edge? 
Uh, I'm not sure what that means, uh, historical odds of something happening. I, I rely on that for an edge. I mean, uh, yeah. most of my statistical studies are historical studies, but I also recognize that um, anything can happen. I also recognize that the outcome of each individual trade is unknown. So I Did I lose you there? I, I still factor in the fact that um, the fact that uh, you know statistics have limitations, and because statistics are generally done on a finite data set, uh, and the market's action is infinite uh, in its nature, um, I, I have to account for the fact that you know anything can happen. So I still sure. have some pretty tight risk rules. Uh, and I just fire away based on that historical edge. And also, the, the last thing I want to say about historical odds is you have to have a large data set to realize that edge. So if you historically look at, for example, the overnight high-low statistics, a statistic that I did in that last um, webinar I did for you, Mike, where I showed step-by-step step how I come up with a 96% probability of the overnight high or low being broken, 96 is a pretty high uh, of a high edge uh, in trading. Um, but the 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 fact is that um, you know that's that's varying over time, and uh, and you just have to account for the fact that sometimes it just does not work. You know, so getting the getting the edge is important, but uh, how you execute it. Is, is equally important and you have to have a large sample of data for that 96% edge to show up if it will show up and it has not changed. Uh, Rex wants to know, is it worthwhile to go back through historical charts to test a hypothesis such as rejection of previous day's volume point of control and then count how many times it worked versus how many times it did not? If so, what else should he also keep track of, like how far it went? Uh, he only uh, the only way to do this type of historical volume profile is by hand. He's asking if that's true. Uh, if you're unsophisticated as I am unsophisticated, then yes, you have to do it by hand. I do use Excel heavily. Uh, I can export, for example, I can pull up. I have a chart that just gives me the prior day's point of control, and I can pull up any chart in IRT and export. Um, that information, uh, where is that chart? But uh, maybe I won't find it. But um, I can take and and export that. Uh, here's the VBOC movement right here. Okay, I'm missing some data for this day, but this is essentially the movement of VBOC over time, and I can take that and export this data. Uh, the indicator data into an Excel sheet and then overlay that with um, bar data to, to test out that hypothesis. So what I do is I do it through Excel with some heavy, heavy filtering and uh, manipulating that information to get me close to something that I can then verify uh, manually. If you're someone who's very good with MySQL and you're great with queries or you're someone who's good at coding or using R or MATLAB or something like that, MATLAB, um, then it's much, much easier for you. But that's what it takes. I mean, that's the hard, that's the hard work. Um, and, and by the way, that's just a portion of what you have to do. The, the real issue, and as a broker, uh, since I became a broker and I'm privy to looking at people's accounts and their issues and work with traders all the time with their trading issues, uh, I find that, uh, and this is a, just my opinion, I find that the issue is not finding an edge. You can find an edge. I mean, Big Mike, uh, the forums on Big Mike are just chock full of folks who are sharing their plan and are trading it. The issue on those trading journals, if you look at Attitude Traders and, and many others, the issue you'll find is execution. Um, and that's where the, the painful part is. And that's the last uh, question in the AMA thread that I was answering before I stopped, uh, is that we discuss psychology and so forth. So I'm, I'm answering your question in more detail. 
uh, but the, the key is finding that edge. And as far as what you should test for, that is really up to you. I mean, there are so many different ways to trade this market. Uh, what you have to test for is what makes sense to you. And over time, you start to recognize certain habits or behaviors in the market that you'd like to take advantage of. And then you'd have to go back and test for those. Um, just you know, use use good data. It's so important to not be cheap on your data because that's really the tool you have, uh, or the information you have to base your business decisions on while you trade. Uh, Derek is asking, what are the characteristics of a weak or a strong high or low, and can you show a recent example? Okay, so. All right, so a weak high or low, um, so let's look at how the auction works. The auction moves along and it tests, it tests prices. That's, that's our job as traders and what the market does is nobody in the market knows what's going to happen next. They're all playing off a of probability. I don't care if you're a $15 billion hedge fund or a trader trading a $2,000 account. You really don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you just know that there, there are odds of one thing happening over another. You define your risk and you just go for it. And it, so it, the process of you entering the market, defining your risk of taking the trade and then closing the trade is simply a test. That's what you're doing. You're just testing an idea with your money uh, by, by betting on it. And so what the market does is it tests and it retests and tests and retests. And Generally, when there is a price that is unfair, I'll show you one that's pretty clear. So let's look at this day here. It opens at uh, 44 and a quarter, and it moves down to the prior day's VPOC right here at 40 even. And then it starts to move up, pull back, move up, pull back higher and higher as it walks its way. It gets into the lunchtime balance, and then it finally breaks higher and closes the VPOC on the other side that was left behind from the 22nd, I believe, the October 22nd. This is a typical strong low where as prices go lower, look at the volume profile. It just parabolically drops. Um, parabolic drops in interest. There are fewer and fewer people willing to participate at lower prices. That's a pretty decent low. An even better low is an excess low, which is what this is, where it's parabolically the other way. <laughs> it just The volume just goes to nothing as it pushes lower. Nobody's interested at these prices, therefore there's no volume. A weak high, and we see those a lot overnight, I don't have an immediate example of an, a weak high recently, um, but a weak high tends to test and retest and test and retest. There are some weak highs and lows that are much more obvious in the euro. Uh, so this is a weak, this is a weak low here, right before this bar that's taking place. This is a weak low in that it tested this 137.55, 56, 57. If this price was too cheap, it should not be retesting it. And there shouldn't be a lot of volume in that retest. Yesterday, tested 77, 137.76, pulled back to 78. But look at the amount of volume traded on those tests. Just a tremendous amount of volume. There should not be, for the, for the low to be strong, there should not be retests. Whereas traditionally, people think that if you have a double top or a double bottom, that shows strength. You know, the double bottom shows that the buyers are strong here. I, statistically, in my studies, uh, I show the opposite. I show when the market returns to a price put in that double bottom, if it does it on heavy volume, that is a weak low. And it's, it's more likely to break than to hold. So I don't have very clear examples. Generally, they happen intraday uh, where you would see a weak high or a low before the market actually, because the market generally do not, does not leave those behind. I can't find those historically uh, very easily. But intraday, you'll find that the market does leave those behind quite a bit. Today, balance in the ES, upwards and downwards, you know, the volume tapers off pretty strongly. 
at the top of the session and at the low of the session, you have a very fat profile in the middle. middle. This is balanced. There is no weak high or low, but the trend is up, so you have to see this as flagging and then likely to continue breaking higher. Um, so that's as good as, a, as I can do with the information that I have right now. Okay. Greg is asking on the ES, do you, do you include the overnight session when finding a low volume node or high volume node? Um, and, are, and are those drawn from the cash? Okay. okay. So basically he wants to know overnight or real time cash only? Uh, I generally look at the overnight for clues on the open, but once I do that, it's over. So I, I look at the... Um, I look at the overnight session just to get an idea of what the open might look like. Uh, so, you know, I looked at yeah, last night's overnight. I, I noted this 50, uh, 59 LVN here, and it's a likely, likely test. The 59 LVN lines up with the value high of the prior day, um, but that's it. Then I dispose of the overnight session except for the overnight statistic, high-low statistic. I'm not all that interested yet in the overnight session because it's trading without the underlying instruments. It doesn't have the arbitrage going on against the stocks or spiders, and it's not that relevant to me at the moment. But there's more and more volume creeping into the overnight session, so it's becoming more and more significant. But all of my levels on the day come from the day session only. Okay, Tracy is asking, if you had to choose only one, which one would you choose, high volume node or low volume node? To trade off of? Yeah. Uh, I can trade off of both. I don't like HVNs or high volume nodes um, simply because there's a lot of interest in high volume nodes. So this is a high volume node. A low volume node looks more like this. This is a low volume node where there's like a divot or an indent in the profile. Um, low volume nodes show that the, the market's rejecting certain prices. Um, and high volume nodes show that the market's accepting a, a price range. The issue with high volume nodes is it takes a while for the market to move away from them. So if I have, just like I said, this looks like it's flagging for a continuation higher, it's not able to maintain yesterday's uh, range or value. It got down to 59, that level we talked about. Uh, didn't quite get to yesterday's value, so the expectation is for this to continue higher. Today's point of control is higher than yesterday's point of control. Trend is still firmly in place. Uh, the point of control is outside of yesterday's rain, range. Again, another affirmation that the trend is still in place. So I expect this to flag until some point in the afternoon uh, for it to break towards that 1770 level that I was discussing at the beginning of the session. So, and I want to get long, let's say. If I get long anywhere near this, uh, this pink line, this uh, volume point of control at 61.75, my expectation is that it would just chop around and chop around and chop around, and for that reason, my stop has to be really wide. Um, and that's why I don't like them. I, I'm, I'm more of a scalper in nature. I scalp my, into my trades, and then I try to hold a runner uh, for the breakout. Um, but for, with LVNs, you have an, a clear area where the market rejected. See how this is a bulky profile, and all of a sudden, there's a, a divot here. This is an important area. The next time it tests it, it gives me an opportunity to take a bet, uh, given context, say for a long. Um, but I don't have to have a very wide stop. For this 54 and a quarter long, my stop really only has to be two points for me to be wrong on that idea. Once it breaks through and gets to this high volume node down here, this low volume node is no longer valid. So I prefer, my preference is an LVN. I feel like you find out if you're right or wrong much more quickly with an LVN than you do with a high volume node. Okay. And Rex is asking about midpoints. He says you've mentioned before that sometimes you'll enter on a midpoint. Would you use the midpoint on a balanced bell-shaped profile like today? Good question. No, I wouldn't. So context is king. How many here understand what context means? Go ahead and just type yes if you do, no if you don't. How many here understand what context in trading means? It's a very important uh, aspect of trading. Um, so to answer the question on the midpoint, the context for today is an open auction. It opened outside of that, uh, prior day's range, so it can only do a couple of things. 
it can either, because it's op opening outside of value, it can either drive, drive away from the prior day's range, somebody's motivated enough to push prices higher, which was not expected. Uh, if you watch this morning's trader bite, you'll see that. That's what that was. I discussed the fact that it's likely to chop around and then test into the prior day's range, find a base around 58.50, and then continue higher. And so we had an open auction out of range, which means there are two-way trades. Uh, there's not a driver in the market. If there's no driver in the market, the market's likely to go into balance and get choppy. If it's choppy, then buying or selling the mid is likely to chop me as well. It's likely to traverse, uh, traverse uh, uh, past that price consistently as it is done. But on a, on a day where the market has pushed away from the mid, I think, uh, I think a bunch of us at stage five were short this yesterday. Uh, when it pushes away, it broke this IB low yesterday and pulled back to the mid. To me, that's a better setup for a short of mid for a continuation lower. Why? Because it broke out of the prior day's range and fell back into it and came all the way down to that prior day's value and had a pullback. So this, was, this looked like a new trend forming lower, pullback to mid. Expectation is for uh, for 17.50 to be tested from the mid, so you had uh, 55 to 50 five-point rotation. Probably risk two points for a five-point rotation with a decent probability of it continuing in the range, and that trade did not work. That is a much better situation for a mid test rather than a day like today. We have a perfectly balanced profile, and uh, you're likely to get chopped uh, trading the mid. All right, Chris is asking if you trade other contracts like grains, currencies, metals, and if you find that volume profile works just as well on those instruments. Absolutely. Um, I, I trade everything using um, volume profiling. So like someone had asked about uh, gold earlier, and I was pulling up a gold chart, and, and immediately I'm going to look at uh, Comex Gold, the RT or the pit session, and I'm immediately going to look at how this profile looks. Um, and so it doesn't matter to me. I mean, if I trade the DAX using volume profile, uh, Russell, crude oil, whatever. It's the same. For me, when I see that the market's building uh, a, a fat bell-shaped profile like this, um, when the market's not able to get to the prior day's high volume price here in gold at 1353, chances uh, the probabilities are better for a test lower targeting 3290 and gold has started to make that move as I had anticipated. So to me, uh, you know, volume profiling works in across all markets. You have to adjust for the fact that some products are less liquid than others uh, and because they're less liquid, they tend to run through levels much farther. Like the Dow will run through levels by six to eight ticks. So if you trade volume-based profiles, or even FIBS or whatever, you kind of have to have a pretty wide stop, 11, 12 ticks, in order to stay in that particular trade. But the same rules apply when the market's making a, a tight, a low-range bell-shaped profile. The expectation, it's coiling, it's balancing. The expectation is for imbalance, and there you have it. A nice gap up the following day. This is a, this was last Thursday. Uh, this is behaving exactly as I would expect. Uh, a lot of people are taking a position short here against the longs. That's what forms these profiles. And once it breaks out, you expect the move to be strong. The market comes back, retests the prior day's range, and then continues higher. Um, the trend was pretty firmly down in, in gold for a while, uh, but, it, but it now has recovered, and it's moving towards its high volume prices. So. 6390 is where it's trying to work itself up to, uh, but for, for the very short term, it's it's retesting lower prices. Same same information, same process. The auction is the same whether you're trading gold, crude oil, uh, real estate, uh, your car, whatever. You know, it'd be wonderful to be able to get a volume profile based on your car model type and year and see where prices have traded, so you can make an intelligent decision as to where to buy or sell a car. You know. It works the same. It's based on human nature and auction principles. 
Peter is asking about the opening swing. He says, what is the process to get the numbers? Because it looks more discretionary than mechanical to him. And he wants to know uh, what adds the opening swing to your, to your trading bias, or more specifically, what to watch, like for range, relative position to other prices, or, or what? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So the opening swing is defined as, it's not, the op it's not like the opening range. There's, a, there's an opening range that comes out of the pit, and I think it's based on 15 minutes or the first uh, trading period in the pit, first trading bracket in the pit. The opening swing, though, is, is not uh, based on time. It's, based, it's essentially measuring the first push up and turning point, or the first peak we put in after the open, and the first low we put in after, after the open. And essentially it is measuring the forces that are in play as soon as the market opens. And those are based on market on open orders, uh, people just wanting to get in or out of the market immediately after it opens. Um, and, and what I do is I measure it and I put it on and it gives me some clues on the day. Just like the initial balance, which is the first hour, um, that's a time-based metric, and it's on here. It's these yellow lines. Uh, it's outlining which which of these, uh, you know, what the high and low is. The opening swing is is more fluid. And initially for today, I had it at 62.75. You can see the market opened here at 61.50, went to 62.75, down to 61, then it pushed to 64. I re got rid of the 62.75 because when it came back to 62.75, it did not pause. It did not touch it try higher and break through. That would have confirmed the 62.75. So instead, I moved the sw opening swing high to 64. The opening swing low stays at 60.75 because that was the initial opening swing. There's no time limit, but it should happen within the first 15 minutes um, to figure out what the opening swing is. What does it tell me? It tells me who is participating in the market. If, I could, if, if the market opens and there's no opening swing low, in other words, it just pushes and pushes and pushes, pulls back, pushes, pushes, pulls back, that means there's a driver in the market, what's called an other time frame player or participant. Uh, there's a driver in the market in the direction of, of, uh, of buying, and that's when I put out on Twitter caution shorts. Uh, and it tells me to lay off the short side. But if I have a tight, a very tight opening swing, and it stays within it for a period of time, then I have to think about what economic releases are coming, what is the market waiting for, and depending on how tight it is, it tells me that it's likely to break out in force one way or another. But if you have a nice swing here, it's three points initially, it was only a, a, a two points, a point, 1.75 points, that's fairly tight opening swing, uh, so I expect when it breaks, it'll break pretty strong, uh, but for a, for a three-point opening swing, which is a pretty standard opening swing, uh, I, I see that it's a two-way market. I'm waiting for the consumer confidence numbers at uh, 10 Eastern today to decide what is next, and if the market continues to crisscross the opening swing, again, it's between 61 and 64, if it continues to crisscross across the opening swing, that I'm not doing any mid-trades, and I'm trading from the outside in, from the edges in, uh, because I know that, that, that this, way, this, is a, this is a tattletale for a two-way market. Here we finally have the breakout on the upside, like I was just outlining uh, when we first started. So the market's kind of auctioning the way uh, it's expected to auction. Alexander is asking if there are any clues that you can pick up to determine what type of day it's going to be uh, before the initial balance of the first hour is established. Yeah, so for that, uh, again, the opening swing, which is a timely question here after Peter's, uh, for that we have the opening swing that helps us determine what kind of a, an open we have. Once I have an open you know, an opening type, which I define on web, my website, just go to futurestrader71.com forward slash glossary, and you'll see a list of opening types. And the opening types give me uh, uh, some clues as to what I should expect uh, the day to, to give us, uh, you know, is it a balanced day, is it an imbalance, you know, an out of balance day where we're likely to trend, is it tight, is it above uh, the range, is it above value, is it, is it inside? All of those things provide 
context, that, that magic word, context. And that, that happens well before um, the initial balance is in. Uh, so this is just a, the, there are some things you can see. And the whole time, the idea as a trader here is to be a forensic scientist and to kind of pick up clues and facts as to what the market's saying as opposed to what you think it should do. Uh, you think it's gone up too far, so you've been shorting for the last week and losing money. Don't want to do that. Want to see what it's telling us obje as objectively as humanly possible, and then take the bets that satisfy the facts that you have picked up. And you know the opening swing, uh, opening type, uh, the IB, how the IB is treated, all that stuff is uh, are, are items that little tools that we we can use to figure out what it's trying to do. So FT, we're at 30 minutes. Uh, since we haven't done one of these in a while, do you have a few extra minutes today or, or no? I'm at your disposal. Okay, so let's keep going just for a few more questions. Uh, Christopher is asking if you listen to news while you're trading, and if so, which news services do you use? Yeah, I uh, uh, you know you probably hear it in, in pretty much all of my videos, including this this uh, this webinar. There's constantly news in the background. I'm using the subscriber version, uh, the full subscriber version of Ransquak, and I also use ITC Markets, which is a newer feed. Uh, those are fairly expensive services. They're like three hundred dollars a piece or something. Um, so they're not they're not for everyone. If you're looking for news feed recommendations or or, or help in, in, in that uh, in that format, uh, shoot me an email through my website. Just go to futurestrader71.com forward slash contact uh, and let me know, and I'll try to help you navigate the uh, the you know the information uh, jungle. Uh, there's there there are services that you can subscribe to or get for free that all they do is just add noise. You want a news feed that tells you what you need to know for the particular uh, sector or market that you're in as opposed to something that's just constantly talking about stock upgrades and downgrades for stocks that are you know worth a dollar or something. So you want to minimize. More information is not better for trading. Uh, you've got to keep that in mind. Okay, JB is asking a question about bell curves. He says, when the bell curve is complete, how do you know what direction the market's going to move next? Okay, so that's a, that's a good question. So when, a, when the markets, uh, so before we broke out, we had a nicely shaped, as you had already seen, uh, nicely shaped Gauss, what's called a Gaussian or bell curve. Um, how, do, how do I determine what it's likely? Remember, keep, keep your... Uh, terminology flexible uh, when it comes to trading. Don't use firm words like needs to, should, must, because that, set, that sets you into, sets your mentality into one outcome and it's a very costly way to trade in my opinion. Um, but you know, when we have these bell curves and the market's coiling, uh, the likely breakout is based on context. If, if this bell curve was here, Let's see if I can draw it on. If the bell curve was here uh, and the VPOC is below the one that's currently there, it keeps disappearing because uh, the chart's refreshing, uh, then I would say the odds are 50-50. But because it's up here and the trend has just continued upwards, then the odds are going to be with the trend. Uh, the, the, the energy that's in the market is buying energy. So my bet is going to uh, be with the buying, and that's why I mentioned that it's likely to break out after lunch and, and continue higher towards that 1770. So how do you know which way it's likely to break out? Context. Context. You're, you're trading an unfolding uh, story, um, and so you want to be aware of what that story is telling you. Uh, much like you know, following Breaking Bad or whatever, you need to know what happened in the last episode to kind of get a feel for what's happening in this episode and what's likely to happen going into the next one. Okay. Uh, David is asking if you use any type of pivot points in your decision making. I don't. Uh, I did very heavily. I I've traded using fibs and 
floor pivots and modified floor pivots and I don't believe in mathematical um, for for my time frame and so forth I really couldn't care less that we're at S1, S2, R1, R2 or the pivot it doesn't mean anything to me um, I find that it obstructs uh, the important factor and that is what is the market trying to do uh, how good of a job is it doing what is it more likely to do what what is it most likely to do from here uh, I find that you know those have an effect when you look at pro floor pivots and fibs and so forth they have an effect because there's a number of people who follow them or watch them and trade them so you get that initial reaction but I'm trading a general bias my confidence in my trading is is based on my confidence in how I'm reading the market and the story that's unfolding in front of me and as long as I'm trading in the direction of that bias or context uh, then then I'm willing to risk you know a few thousand dollars per trade or whatever uh, to see my bias play out but when you're when you're relying on mathematical numbers it fogs things a little bit I'm not saying it's a wrong way to do it there is no right or wrong way to trade uh, but it's just not for me, and so I don't use it. Okay, John says that his understanding is that you mostly fade extremes of value. So what are things that you look at when you're at those extremes to help you decide whether or not to fade or whether a break from current value is more likely? I don't. I actually do not fade extremes of value. Um, that's not how I trade. Generally, there's a general thought that those people who are using volume or market profile are just always uh, reverting to the mean uh, type of type of trading. I don't. Uh, I I trade the I trade whether I'm trading from the outside in, which means you know the extremes in, or the inside out, which means from the middle of the range outwards in the trending. It just depends on what the the mood of the market is. However, I do. I'm always fading something, and all of us are always fading something. I do not trade breakouts uh, because it puts my uh, stop or a, you know uh, error point uh, too far away from my entry. So if the market breaks out higher, I'm not going to sell it just for the sake of selling it. I'm going to wait for it to pull back against some profile level to take the long so I'm fading the short-term pullback on an up uptrending breakout I'm fading the short-term uh, pullback to get long with the trend so I'm always fading something if the markets in balance then I'm looking for it to break um, the high for example by a couple of ticks and I'll fade that back to balance back to the VPOC uh, because I've determined that the markets in balance and then the, the the times when I lose are when the market shifts from balance to imbalance or imbalance back to balance then I have to kind of pay up uh, because my bet's not going to work in that situation but I don't fade uh, I'm not constantly fading moves or trends I'm I'm spending most of my time determining what the market's biases or the context is and then finding a pullback uh, or an extreme to to trade because that's what puts the entry as close as possible to my stop, um, and that's how I like to I like to take a lot of small risks rather than a big swing type risk, which 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 maybe is how you trade, Mike, because you trade a, a, a higher time frame. Yeah, but that's not how I trade. RJ is asking uh, when a trend is underway. It is sometimes difficult to find an entry point. So what do you feel that qualifies as a pullback for a possible entry point? That's a that's a million dollar question there. I am not a good trend trader. Uh, days where you have a large trend and the market's just ripping up, all I can do is uh, wait for wait for it to subside and wait for the pullback. Um, but in general, on strong trends, the market's only good for about a three-tick pullback before the continuation. I'm just not good at reading that, so I'm not qualified to answer that. I know my weakness, and my weakness is a trend day. Those are not good days. The good news is trend days happen somewhere around 18 to 21 percent of all days in a given year, uh, and that's on a 1,400-day data set. Uh, so 
what does that translate to? It translates to about three days a month that, uh, or two or three days a month where I have to be very, very picky and maybe not participate. Uh, and I'm willing to give that up uh, in favor of, of days where the market's auctioning both ways. Uh, so it's hard to determine when the trend is going to happen. I do have tools for it and I do have a plan for it. But jumping on a trend is not something that I'm very good at. And if you figure out a good way, I'd love to hear from you, you know. Uh, Sever is asking for day trades. How long is your composite? Do you look at the five-day composite or something else? Uh, the composite actually goes back to the date shown here, 10-4-2011. So it's accumulating all data going back that far. Um, and then when the market's in balance, so let me pull up my volume profile chart. When the market's in balance, I draw these micro composites, which encompass areas that are in, uh, in a balance zone. It's starting to break away from balance, so I'm not going to be able to extend it another day. Um, but, you know, I look for when the market breaks higher, I don't draw it. The next day, if it continues higher, I don't draw it. The next day, if it continues higher, I don't draw it. But as soon as it pulls back on itself, I immediately draw it for the prior three days, and it gives me these very clear unauctioned or poorly auctioned areas that I can uh, trade off of. Um, and, and as the market continues, so the next day is done, we're trading this day, I'll extend that out to see what's happened in these last four days. And as long as it's inside of that range, I'll keep extending it out and out uh, to determine what those areas are. And you can see I use these, this, this micro composite here to outline these key areas below us, 49 and a quarter, 43.75, and 39, which we keep walking away from because the trend is not over. Uh, so I have a major composite that is based on October 4, 2011. And the reason I have that date is that's the last major swing low that we've had, and I'm looking at everything that started on that last major swing low. Um, and, but otherwise, and on the shorter term, I'm looking at micro composites, which are, which are based on the last few balanced days. When the market's in a trend, I don't draw a micro composite because it's just trending. Okay. Okay. So since we're already uh, over the time limit, I'm going to stop us right there. And anybody that did not get their question answered by FT71 today can go to BMT and on the top right search box just type in AMA space FT71. That will take you to the main thread. And you can ask your question there and FT drops in time to time and, and answers everybody's questions. So FT, as always, I thank you for your time today. It's been a while since we've done this, so nice to get back on track. <laughs> Very cool, yeah. Hope you had I'm a good glad vacation. You're feeling better. I'm, I'm, I hope you're feeling better, and I'm glad you're feeling better. You sound pretty good. Uh, I always appreciate you having me on, so and yeah. wherever I can help, I'd love to help. Now, after the vacation, at least at least I didn't get didn't get sick on vacation. It was the very last day <laughs> on my way back. So, all right, man. All right, well, Very I'll see cool. you again in a couple weeks. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Take care. All right, bye.